Hey, good evening, and welcome to a special edition of Montpelier Civic Forum. And we have a very special guest, uh, Libby Bonesteel, our superintendent of the Montpelier Roxbury School District. And she's going to talk about the school opening. And I want to tell you when this is being taped. It's being taped Monday the 23rd. So everything we say might be different next week, but it is true as of right now. And from prior experience, not much of it will change in a week. Right. Libby, when do the schools open? We invite students back on Thursday of this week. And you expect students on Thursday? Yes. That there's a difference between inviting and expecting. Now, whenever I interview you, it's usually about the budget, mm -hmm. except for when we're talking about a pandemic disease. And we've done a couple of these now on the pandemic disease. It's your third school year going through this. Mm -hmm. Uh, is this other duties as a sign? <laughs> <laughs> this is what I signed up for when I signed my contract of superintendent. Uh, so you felt at that time that you would be a frontline worker? <laughs> no, no, I would definitely not say that, but it is what it is. Let's start a couple of years ago when we shut down as a state in March. How much time did you have to prepare for that? About a week, but maybe a little less than a week. Did the state, you can hear a railroad, that, what you're hearing is a railroad train in the mm -hmm. background. Um, did the state have dictates or were you off on your own? We were on our own. Uh, we worked very closely with our teachers union and uh, got something going relatively fast with their hard work. And that was the virtual presentation. Mm -hmm. Was it a success or, or do you know how to, how to, to put metrics to it? I think um, many people would have a different answer to that question. Uh, our teachers made it through with their mental health intact, and I think the large majority of our students did as well. We all did the best we could. Um, I know there's lots of different opinions on that, but I'll say it. We did the best we could in that moment. But you felt that it was successful enough that you went into a dual system in the fall. You had the opportunity, I, I believe, to just do in school? Our fall was different than, than what it was in the spring of 2020. Um, that was an emergency situation our fall was planned for. So uh, the difference being is that our se seventh through 12th graders, if they chose a virtual option, they wor we worked with Vermont, um, the Vermont Virtual Learning Collaborative, sorry, I had a mind blank there, VTVLC. And our younger kids, kindergarten through grade six, worked with our actual teachers. We created another school, essentially, a virtual academy. Um, and those teachers only taught virtual students. So we were able to design something different with some more planning time. Um, we worked all summer on it. Mike Berry was our principal of our virtual academy for our kindergarten through sixth grade. So it was essentially its own school. Um, for last year. That was not how it was in the spring when we had to close in an emergency situation. Now, is that sitting, if, if we get a COVID outbreak, a major COVID outbreak in one of these schools, are we going back to that? Or what, what is the planning for a major outbreak? We would have to go into a virtual learning again. But um, we're, we're set up to do that. In a different way, yes. It's not, we have, our teachers have more experience with that piece. They know they know what to expect. Even teachers who didn't do it last year, like some of our middle school teachers, our Roxbury teachers never had to go virtual. Most of our UES teachers didn't. Most of our high school teachers didn't. Um, so, but they all were planned for that. Um, and so they could do that relatively easy. We have the technology we know how to do now. I, there's a lot of different things that we know how to do that we weren't sure how to do on a dime in March of 2020. So we're in a different place there. Now, in that experience of last year, mm -hmm. you know, which was fluid and the like, I imagine that your outreach to parents got a lot more sophisticated and, and basically you could reach them faster and more certainly. We had it down, we had it down to a science, whereas I would send out nearly weekly communication, particularly in the beginning and middle of the year, not so much at the end of the year, but the beginning and middle of the year, um, either once or twice weekly, and I typically tried to send things out on Fridays, and then our principals all send their weekly memos out, weekly newsletters out on Monday, so they would reiterate what I said on Friday on their Monday newsletter and often talk more specifically about their own school. 
Um, we also have, thanks to our communication specialist, Anna Hipko, a, a robust um, communications and social media outreach. And so as soon as I, mine went out, hers went out uh, on social media with links. And as soon as the principals went out, Anna had those up as well. So we had a pretty well-oiled machine, particularly in the fall and winter of last year for communication. Are we to the point of texting parents yet? I have the capacity to text parents if they've signed up for it, if they've turned that on. Not all parents turn that on. Are all of our parents hooked to the internet? The large majority are, yes. We know that. Now, when we come to the um, virtual academy, I want to stay with that because there's a large set of students that were out for a year. Mm -hmm. What is the percentage of students that were out? I'm, I'm not trying to trick you with a question I know the answer to. <laughs> Uh, Roughly what percentage? We had approximately 30% of our student body in virtual learning last year. So you're reintegrating. Now, some of those graduated, or did they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're reintegrating a sizable chunk of kids who've been out of the social flow, mm -hmm. uh, at least the school social flow. They still lived within the boundaries yes. of, of the yeah. town. What steps are you guys taking to make sure that socially that works? Uh, yeah, we're... Well, so we redesigned our calendar once again. We did this last year, actually, too. But we have parent conferences um, tomorrow and Wednesday. And we'd really like for um, families to consider that an in-person conference so that students and families can get into the buildings and see the classrooms and the teachers. It's a, it's a different dynamic when you're in person and can read body language and can answer, take the time to answer questions and that kind of thing. Um, Will the parents be expected to be masked? Yes, masks are mandated in our district. Um, and so we're, that's our first step. At, at the different buildings, they're doing different things in the first couple of days. And teachers are masters at ensuring that kids feel comfortable in their classrooms. So I know that each individual teacher and team of teachers are thinking about that. But it will look differently depending on the age of the kids. Now, I want to stay with virtual on um, snow days. Mm -hmm. The rumor was out that... The Montpelier Snow Day is a thing of history and that parents will receive word to get your kid online. Yeah, we tried that. Uh, about 66% of our, student, our parent population, our caregiver population, and our teacher population supported the idea of virtual snow days because they like knowing what the last day of school is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but our Secretary of Education said that was not allowable this year, that, we, that he reads the attendance statute of Vermont law to say that it has, a, it has to have a kid in seat. So um, it has to be an in-person day in order to be considered a school day. Now, considering that my school child hasn't been in school for 12 years, how do the parents know uh, that it's a snow day? Do you get in touch with them? And, and Very early in the morning, yes. They hear my lovely voice at about 5.45 to 6 o'clock in the morning. So they don't have to listen to WDEV or any no. of that? No. It's also up on all of our social media sites. Which I'm sure that everybody checks at 5.30 or 6 <laughs> in the morning. Um, do you anticipate that the lessons that we learn from virtual learning will enhance the number of students that take AP classes that aren't offered live at the school? It, it's been an option for years, but it hasn't been used as much. I honestly don't know. I, I, that's yet to be seen. I'm not positive whether or not that will enhance the AP or not. I mean, it, it it allows a small school, the high school, to sit and expand its mm -hmm. curricular borders. But I think we've so had that do. for years. Yeah, now. we have had that for many years. Um, let's go into the schools, and let's talk. Let's start with the school bus. Mm -hmm. um, all kids are required to be masked. Yes. What happens with parental objections to masking? Um, parents can choose what they want to do outside of schools, but inside the buildings and on school buses, the kids will be in masks. So if parents object to it, what happens? We'd have conversations. Kids would come talk to the nurse. Parents would talk to the nurse. We'd have talks with the, the administrators. It's a, it's a matter of a duty of care statute. So I'm responsible by law to provide a duty of care for students. This is a public health crisis. Experts in the field say masks are what will help as a risk mitigation factor. In fact, next to vaccines, it's the highest risk mitigation factor. So there, there's really no question in my mind our students will be masked for the, until further notice. Now, for the younger kids um, who are riding the school bus, uh, when is, are the temperatures going to be taken still? No. No. That was proven as a mitigation 
effort that was not necessary. We are asking caregivers to do a, a check on uh, just well-being check before the kids enter the school building. That would probably be our third highest mitigation risk um, if we're thinking about it in order, uh, that we do not want sick kids and sick people in our, in our buildings. So we ask that if kids have sniffles, com symptoms of common colds, that we keep them home during the day. Our staff, have they been vaccinated? A large majority of them have, yes. Our teachers? A large majority of them. Will we, are we hoping to go beyond 85% to 100% or you're working on that or, or at this point we are what we are? Uh, at th this point we are what we are. We are I believe we are over 85% vaccinated in terms of our staff. Um, I, do, I don't have the exact percentage of that because we haven't asked them. Um, but just knowing and through conversations with our nurses who've talked to pretty much every member of our, our community who works in our buildings and we're well above 85% vaccinated. Kids are going out of state. Mm -hmm. You know, you couldn't last year. You weren't allowed to travel out of state or you're severely discouraged from doing that. Is there a COVID testing capacity at, at the schools when kids yeah. come back into state? Uh, not specifically for when kids come back into state, although the state, I believe, recommends that kids do that or that families do that, or people do that in general. Um, but we are, we did sign on with the voluntary testing that will happen weekly in our district. Um, what is that? Could you explain, please? Yeah. So the state is set up for school districts who wanted to participate voluntary weekly testing for students and staff. Uh, it will happen in the school buildings. Parents will, will opt into it. Um, and when that, we're working out the logistics now, we haven't, we haven't, fit, you know, we're still working with the state as to what exactly that will look like. Kids who are younger than seven, I believe, the test will be done by the school nurse, and it's just the nasal swab that many of us are very used to at this point, and those of us who have gotten tested often. Uh, and anybody older than eight will be doing it a self-administered uh, nasal, nasal swab. So that will happen weekly. We send it off to a lab, and caregivers will be able to check a website to see what the results are pretty quickly. When the vaccine, well, right now, the high school students could be getting the vaccine. A and vaccine. part of our middle school, yeah. Are we gonna do vaccinations at the schools? We have had vaccination sites at Montpelier High School. We've had a few vaccination events. In fact, Governor Scott was vaccinated at Montpelier High School uh, in the spring. So we'll continue to do that when the, when the vaccines become eligible for under 12s, we will- be, And the boosters that are coming. We will be first in line to offer that to our, <laughs> to our students um, and make it as easy as possible. So we'll, we are right there next to the Agency of Education. They know how eager we are to get our students vaccinated, so they reach out pretty quickly and set something up. We're also a centralized location right off the highway, so it's easy access to our buildings in order to get more of the public vaccinated. So we've, been pretty, we've worked very closely with Vermont Department of Health and our Agency of Education to set up vaccination clinics. When it goes down lower and lower in terms of eligibility for this, will we have vaccination clinics at MSMS or at uh, UES or Roxbury? Is that most, anticipated? Most likely our clinics will be at the high school because we don't have parking at uh, <laughs> MSMS or UES. So most likely they'd still be at the high school building um, just because of access. Uh, but that's not to say that's written in stone either. <laughs> you know, They might change how those vaccination clinics go. Uh, where we wouldn't need parking, but we, right now, that's that's the deciding force as to where it is in our district. Is there any policy on unvaccinated students? No. When, um, when that arrives, are you saying that the mask is sufficient? The public health officials are saying masks okay. are efficient, so sufficient. So. How fluid is that right now? I, I'm sure that you're cut well into that loop um, from the Department of Health you know, that, that's feeding into the education realm. Are you seeing a consistent message during the entire period of Delta virus or is that shifting? Um, it shifted considerably. So we, well, it hasn't shifted actually in the last, so we get received our guidance for uh, masking and it wasn't guidance, it was recommendations from- But it was left locally to determine. Yes, for the department, from the Department of Health and the Agency of Education the second week of August um, that was kind of right when Delta was spiking here in Vermont or starting to spike and people were starting to get worried about it. Uh, they've held tight to those recommendations since that time. So what was that, two weeks ago? <laughs> you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that long ago and Delta has certainly 
not gotten any better in the last couple of weeks. Um, so superintendents around the state are having to deal with the fact that their recommendations and not, you know, not rules that have to be followed. Our community has been very supportive of masks. Um, and so for, I haven't heard much from people who don't agree with my decision around masking. Um, was it your decision or the board's decision? It's my, my decision. So the board has authorized me to make safety de decisions for COVID-19. They did it in the last board meeting. And they did it last year too. Um, so I certainly keep them apprised of any decisions that we make. I ask, ask, uh, ask their opinions when I need them, <laughs> but th those are my decisions to make. Last year we were talking about a six foot separation between people mm -hmm. in the schools as well as in public. How has that changed? It's changed to a three feet recommendation and they're recommendations. They're not um, mandates anymore. So because we're not in a state of emergency at the moment, um, we have no framework for guidance or rules around this piece. So for instance, last year we had received a 50 page document around rules that we needed to follow. This year we received a two page recommendation document. Um, so the distancing piece, the, the Agency of Education verbally has said to us, uh, try to keep them as close to three feet apart as you can. And that's what the CDC currently is recommending as well. So we have, we've, we've put in different, um, different pieces to try to make, try to keep kids as apart, separated as possible and not have kids congregate in spaces. Now I'm venturing into something I know nothing about. How's the ventilation in the three schools? Have it's we worked really on It's actually really well, yeah. Andrew the Rose is our director of facilities and uh, right when we closed in the summer, the summer after the first closure, um, he worked very closely with Efficiency Vermont. They offered grant money uh, and Andrew LaRosa was first in line to access that grant money and because he acted so quickly, we have our HVAC system working at, at the highest peak it possibly was designed to do. At which school? All, all four of our buildings. Okay, I was going to ask about Roxbury. Yeah, all four of our buildings. So um, in, Andrew also had engineers who designed our system up on, you know, at the HVACs this summer to ensure that they're still working. We just got new um, controls for Montpelier High School to ensure that that HVAC is actually going to be working better this year than it did in the past. So our air circulation and, and work with the H, HVAC is, is actually quite strong. A pod. Mm -hmm. We went through this last year and we'll go through it this year. What is a pod? Uh, what schools were there pods at? Are there going to be pods this year? Last year, Main Street Middle School, Union Elementary School, and Roxbury Village School used the concept of a pod. So each classroom had two adults in it. It was either a teacher and a teacher or a teacher and another staff member. Uh, and that pod stuck together. They went to the bathroom together. They went, they ate lunch together. They, they were together all the time and did not... They were out at recess together. They didn't um, integrate with other pods in any way, shape, or form. This year, we do not have that system in place. Um, we have kids in homerooms or in classroom rooms. Are we back to where we were several years ago, the same model, or is it a modified model of what many of us are familiar with? It's definitely modified. Uh, so at Union Elementary School, for instance, kids will be starting the year eating in their classroom instead of um, 100 kids in the cafeteria. We've also got, uh, if you go past Main, Montpelier High School, I haven't been past Main Street Middle School today, but if you go past Montpelier High School, there's a big circus tent up that we're going to have picnic tables underneath so, kids, so we can spread kids outside for recess and for classroom activities and things. And we're putting one out in front of Main Street Middle School as well. It's a little tighter fit, <laughs> fit there. <laughs> um, so so we had to dig up the street in order to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was not us. So we, uh, we won't be potting kids. We, we weren't planning on potting kids, and this Delta variant hit Vermont very late in the summer. Um, and in order to do the pods again, or in order to do the pods, we had to do significant shuffling of kids and of teachers and of classrooms, and we, just, we simply don't have the time to do that. Sociologically, what's the difference between a class and a pod? Do kids see more kids? Uh, different kinds of kids. Traditionally, in class. if it's a tra if it's a tr traditional class structure or homeroom structure, yeah, you especially at Main Street Middle School, you you integrate with more kids. Um, you might have classes with different groups of kids. This year, we're keeping homerooms together as they move from class to class. So we are we have a little bit more control than we would in a typical year. Um, and I know class classrooms at the elementary school generally are, with the exception of lunch and recess, 
are generally just with their classroom. You know, you don't switch to, with other classrooms to go to music, for instance. You go to music. So we're with, having music now. Mm -hmm. We're having plays. We're having sports. Yep. All of that is planned to go on this year. Even though it's difficult to play a woodwind through a mask. Yeah, they have special masks. So uh, <laughs> last year in the spring, the music, music was able to begin. Last year, um, late, you know, around April. And our music team followed the guidance. We're starting this year right where the guidance left us last year. So kids playing instruments have special masks that are designed with a small hole in it to fit the instrument in. Um, our singers will be wearing just a mask, and just a typical mask. Um, so we have safety precautions in place, but we want to make sure that our students who are more musically inclined get that opportunity. Watching an ultimate Frisbee game <clears throat> On the sidelines, I'll be expected to be masked? Uh, we haven't gotten any rules around that yet. We're not sure. Well, I'm, I'm using that as an example. If, if I'm watching a basketball game in the gym. If you're in the gym, yes. right As of right now, you'd be masked. To what age? If I've got you know, little brothers and sisters, at, at, at what age is masking mandatory? Our pre-Ks are in masks. Any, anybody who's in our building is in a mask. Okay. Yeah. Um, what happens if someone in the class tests COVID positive? Yeah, we're not positive, quite honestly. We believe No that, pun intended. <laughs> yeah, right? We got some, uh, some contact tracing guidelines on Friday that look very similar to the spring of last year. Um, there have been some positive cases in sports teams around the state, not in Montpelier or Roxbury, but around the state where superintendents are getting mixed messages around contact tracing and who needs to quarantine and who doesn't. Um, so we're still, I think the health department is still working that out a little bit. So we're working that, we're waiting for them to work it out so we get the guidance. What is the contemporary quarantine period? So I think last year it was about two weeks. I know last um, year. but So it, we're not positive as to what the VDH is going to tell us this year. As I said, this is fluid right now. Mm -hmm. This is this is Monday before classes start. Yes. What happens? Oh, with, we know. <laughs> um, what happens with the people who are immunocompromised? Yeah. You know, and and who were home last year for that reason, who are coming back again this year. Yeah, it's it's good to be clear that not all of our immunocompromised um, kids were home last year. Several were in person um, as well. So. We have, we have students who fall in that category most definitely. We will do everything we can to mitigate as much risk around them as possible. Um, parents have the option to do home study if they're really worried about it. Um, that's certainly an option for, for parents. Um, but like I said, the, the Delta virus truly spiked in Vermont two weeks ago. Um, so we've really pivoted quickly to put more, guy, more mitigation strategies in place than we were certainly planning. We've changed schedules around at Union Elementary School. We changed schedules around at Main Street Middle School. We've added the tents and the, and the tables to spread kids out more. Not as many kids will be on the recess, out at recess at the same time as we were planning just three weeks ago. So we really, um, we're really cutting down on where congregation sites happen. So we feel comfortable with the cleanliness of, of the the playground at Union. The where cleanliness last year, of it? Well, yeah, I, I don't know. Last year they weren't on that playground, they were out in the street. Oh, they were in both. We spread them out, so. Are, are we gonna have the street again? No. Okay. No, no, the street is back to public use. <laughs> but we feel comfortable with opening that playground again. Yeah, it's Good. scheduled so that there's not as many kids on it at one time. Is there anything else that we've done to accommodate that, that you'd like to discuss? Um, I think just thinking about uh, vaccines, Pfizer, I was listening to VPR on the way over here, and Pfizer just got, it's totally. no longer emergency right. authorization anymore. It's got the full approval of the CDC for 16-year-olds on up. So we just encourage everybody who is able to do so to be vaccinated, because I think that's our way out of this. We'll keep masks on until further notice. Um, and we'll keep our risk mitigation measures in place until until we feel like it's a, it's clear. Is there cleaner. anything that parents can do to support your effort? Yeah, parents can keep their kids home if they show any kind of sickness, any kind of cold symptoms. Um, I would question travel right now, especially if you have unvaccinated students. Travel defined as what? 
uh, travel outside of outside of Vermont. I'd say um, I'd question, you know, me myself as a parent. I'm questioning large going to large places with my unvaccinated ten year old. Uh, we don't do that right now. What about birthday parties? I think that's a parent's choice. Um, that. I think it's parents' choice. I think I'm not trying to cast you know fear into the community. I was just wondering, again, my my son's a lot older. Yeah, I think it's a parent's choice, and it's a matter of what you're comfortable with. You know, my daughter's birthday is coming up in the end of October, and we're planning a much smaller birthday party with people that she's been with all summer. You know, that she's played with all summer, and there's about two or three people in that group. So I feel quite comfortable with that scenario, um, but. That's me. That's my parental decision I've made. So I think parents have to make their own decision. Assuming that COVID is with us in one variation or another, like the flu, you know, uh, that basically it's a fact of life for a while. What does the light at the end of the tunnel that the health department is projecting to you look like? Vaccinated people. If it, we will get to that place when we can count on people being vaccinated against this. That's what the health department had said to us. Now, uh, now I'll go into the social issues. How many unvaccinated children do we have against chicken pox, measles, and the like? What is the anti-vaxxer population like in our, our community? It's actually larger than you think it is. So if you take COVID-19 out, out of the of it, picture, right. um, the last data that I have that I've looked at is, is not the most recent data. I think it's like 2017, so it's not the most recent, but we were at about 85%, and that's... Uh, at the high side for a potential outbreak of something like measles when you're at 85%. What does the high side mean? So the health experts, and I'm not an expert in this, so I may be saying it well, incorrectly. Don't worry, I'm less of an expert <laughs> than you are. So. Um, health effort experts have that kind of point of vac percentage vaccination where they don't necessarily worry an outbreak could happen. But when a window starts getting lar larger and larger, the potential of an outbreak becomes more, just like with COVID. Um, and so with measles, I know that we were at 85%, the health officials want us to be higher, want us to have How a higher vaccination rate. How do we rate. speak to that community that philosophical, it's, it's not a question of convenience. Right. It's a question of core philosophy. How do, how do you speak to that with that community? I think all we can do with our school nurses or pediatricians is just state this is, these are the, these are the facts around the vaccines. Um, and this is, this is the reality of what it is, and parents make their decision. Now, should we have an outbreak, it would hit those who aren't vaccinated? Is there any ancillary blowback to kids who are vaccinated? A COVID-19 no, no, outbreak? No, no, of, no, of measles or chicken pox or any of those common childhood diseases. So ask your question again, I'm sorry. Uh, if 85% are vaccinated, 15% aren't. Mm -hmm. If there were an outbreak you know, amongst that 15%, would that mean anything to the 85%? I think that would be a better question for an epidemiologist or a pediatrician. Okay, uh, I'm not we're positive. We're going to get an epidemiologist <laughs> to answer that question. I'm not positive. Um, uh, let me ask a, a couple of, of questions, just touch questions, that I'm sure make your life more interesting. Is there any discussion of critical race theory in our district? Not that I've heard of other than from teachers and people who are reading uh, what's happening across the nation and within our state and other areas. I have not had any uh, emails from parents or conversations from caregivers or community around critical race theory. I, then I'll just hit you with the question. Is, is critical race theory taught in the elementary school here? Well, you have to think about what that actually is. Critical race theory comes, theory comes from law school and it's looking how laws are have been, it's a theory around how laws were created. It's not an educational term. So we're not teaching critical law theory in our elementary school? We're not, no. We teach to the Vermont standards that we're required to teach to, which talks about talking about perspectives and bias. Those words are in our, our standards documents, um, and that's a measure of a well-rounded education when you can think critically across an idea, a context, a, a story that there are multiple perspectives and there's multiple ways people experience that perspective and that's good teaching. How are we doing that at the high school? I know we've gone the extra step in terms of talking about bias and talking about uh, 
social issues from, mm -hmm. from that perspective. How is that changing and evolving at the high school? I think the evidence is in the pudding there uh, around how strongly our students work with social justice causes, whether it's climate change or racial justice. Um, our students lead the way there. and our Lead it in which way? They are the ones out front. They're the ones out front demanding that Black Lives Matter. They have a race against racism that is planned and designed by students every year. We have coursework designed around perspective and bias and that kind of thing at the high school. We have a very strong sustainability program that's now being uh, extended into the middle school as well. So, What is the sustainability program? Sustainability talks about um, food justice and social justice and climate change, you know, the UN's sustainability goals, United Nations sustainability goals for living. And um, through that lens, we have a significant group of students who very much care, care about our climate and ensuring that we, their grandkids are gonna be able to eat good, healthy food and be able to live in a healthy climate and a healthy planet. So our students, through our education, through caregiver um, focus as well at home, our students have very strong opinions and know quite a bit about social justice movements and are going to be strong voices in the future for a much better place. Is there any blowback on, um, sing on open bathrooms that are used, you know, beyond um, cis identification? Not that I've heard of, no. Okay, just, just yeah. wondering. Yeah, and if one, I know the, the middle school bathroom, when the middle school bathroom remodel happened on the third floor in the, in the basement floor, I guess it would be the first floor, um, one has to see those bathrooms to, to really understand what's happening. You know, they're not traditional stalled bathrooms. The stalls have walls that go all the way up to the ceiling. You know, like there's, there's no way that the, the sharing of the bathroom could be anything other than just use of a bathroom. If my son's been out of, for a couple of decades, I've been out for 50 years. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're, um, they're wide open spaces. Teachers can see what's happening from the hallway. The, the stalls are completely um, private in every way possible. Like there's no way somebody could look underneath because the wall goes all the way to the floor and the wall goes all the way to the ceiling. There's just not, it's just not possible. So the thought was given in, in design. Mm -hmm. uh, again, going to the high school, is one of your special prides uh, the uh, community-based learning that Matt McLean does? I think that's Matt McLean's special pride. I would never take his... No, I, his. I'm saying that so many kids participate in community... First of all, what is community-based learning and what percent do participate in yeah, that? Yeah, Matt and his team have designed an amazing program that's been around way before me um, that offers kids the opportunity to, to learn through internships and apprenticeships out in the, com out in the community. And we have fabulous community partners that help us out with that each year, um, which we thank profusely to have our kids there. And kids have just, it's just a different way to learn. And it's its more of what I can imagine the future being um, rather than the eight to three school day. But how can we design learning so it fits with kids and, and we get them out getting to learn leadership skills and use their voice in a different way. Are there any curricular changes that are being discussed by the board right now that would have an impact on what the school of the future or the schools of the future would look like? We're starting, actually, I was working on an RFP with uh, Mia Moore, one of our board members. An RFP being? A uh, request for proposals. Uh, this morning with Mia Moore, who's one of our board members, uh, around a visioning process, a community visioning process. And the, the RFP is to look for facilitators who can help us um, engage What is a community visioning process? It's interesting because when we merged, we never did this. We never talked about um, what truly do we want out of our education as a, as a new district. Um, and so one of the things that people like to talk about quite a bit is community values. And what I've learned is in my you know, now fourth year as superintendent is that people define that very differently. Um, they may think that they define it similarly, but they may define it similarly as their neighbor or their friendship group, but once you get outside, it could be defined very differently. And so what the board recognizes is that we need to come together and get a professional in here to help really engage stakeholders and ensure that all voices are heard, particularly those from our marginalized group groups, and um, say, well, what are they? Let's name them. So then we can make financial decisions in the future based on them. We can make curricular decisions based on them. We can, any decision we make is held up against this lens that 
that the, the process going forward has determined. Would those stakeholders include those who don't have children in the schools? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And that's why we're trying to get a professional. <laughs> How long do you envision this process taking and when do you envision community meetings and the like? Uh, we're not sure yet. We're in the very beginning stages of this. Like I said, we're literally just writing the RFP today. So, um, and that's going to go to the board for approval on Wednesday, next Wednesday's meeting, not this coming Wednesday, but the Wednesday after. Um, and then we'll put it out. We have in the proposal that the work would start in uh, December and we'd award the contract to somebody in November. We'd The work would start in December and go through June of 2022. This, again, is not a trap question. Um, what um, capital improvements have been made over the summer and, and are coming in in the fall in the schools? Yeah, if you walked into Main Street Middle School, you'd see a completely different, Besides brighter gym. Besides the tents in front. Uh, yeah, that's not an infrastructure piece, though. Uh, Main Street Middle School's gym got repainted. It's bright and cheery now, <laughs> which is beautiful. Uh, much different space than what um, it was certainly in the spring. Um, other major projects, we got new control system at, at Montpelier High School to help with the HVAC, to make the HVAC work even stronger than it did in the spring. Um, those, were the, those were the biggies. Those were the actual major, major pieces of capital besides typical classroom renovations, which we do every year. You know, we kind of do two or three classrooms every year in a building. Well, I know you have capital projects every year, major capital projects written in. Mm -hmm. year after year. That, that's the reason I asked. Yeah, we just had a presentation with the board last Wednesday concerning um, kind of a laundry list so the board can start having conversations with our community around what, what we want to prioritize for, for federal money that's coming in as well as our capital plan. Libby, I thank you so very much for yeah. answering a long laundry list of questions well beyond COVID. No Is there problem. anything else that we're on the eve of school? What should kids... What should parents say to their kids? They're coming on in, back into those schools. For some of them, they've been gone for a year. Yeah. Um, so what's your message to a parent? I think it depends on where the parent is themselves and their anxiety level. Um, this is what we do. We keep kids safe. We do our best to do that. We know how to do that. We know kids really well. At Montpelier High School, I have the best teaching staff and, and, and other staff in the state by far. Um, and so I, everything's going to be okay. We're going to have some bumps. We're going to, no doubt about it, we may have to go remote. We may not. I don't know. <laughs> Nobody really knows those answers. But we will do the best we can. And kids' safety is the absolute utmost concern that we have. And so we're going to do everything we can to do that. So I think uh, as, as I think of, of my parent hat myself, my spin for my kids is always a positive one, is always one that things will be okay. You can trust what's happening. You can, you know, go talk to people when you're not when you're not sure. Who are the people? Is it the the school super or school super? I'm sorry. People are more than welcome no, to come no, talk no. to me. No, the school <laughs> is it the school principal that? Sure, you can talk to your principal. Yeah, any of us would be happy to talk to parents, caregivers, and students if they're if they're nervous or anxious. We have a large social work staff. Our guidance counselors, any of our teachers, we're all there. We love kids, and that's what we want them to feel as comfortable as they can be in, front, in our hallways and in our classrooms. So that's what we do, um, and we hope that there's that open line of communication when things aren't working that we can figure it out with our caregivers. Um, but really, our kids feed off of what you know the adults around them, the, the vibes the adults around them are, are giving them. So if it's a positive can-do vibe, the kid will feed off of that. So I, I encourage parents to do that. I also encourage when kids can be vaccinated to get your child vaccinated. If I could put an editorial comment to those parents as well, I'd encourage everyone to get vaccinated. Yes, true. Uh, in our community, if we can approach 100%, that would be collectively the best for all of us. And that would be what would keep our kids in school. Thank you so very much for watching. This was Montpelier Civic Forum.